In this video we cover multi-factor analysis of variance and it's a pretty simple extension of what we already covered. So instead of one treatment level like we had before, so we just had varieties, we introduce more treatments in our analysis of variance. So in each of those treatments then has multiple treatment levels. So in our example we had a variety with treatment levels A, B, C, and uh, as another factor that was in our data set, we had farm locations, and that was F1 and F2 for two different experimental farm sites. So one thing you can do with two or more factors is look for interactions. So I will cover what that means. The ANOVA table is slightly differently constructed, so we'll take a look at this. And I also briefly give you some examples for those factorial designs that you can use for multi-factor ANOVA. So as I noted before, the concept of multi-factor ANOVA is pretty simple. Instead of having just one treatment with multiple levels, we have two qualitatively different uh, ones. For example, to our variety effect, we might also add an irrigation and a control treatment where you don't have irrigation. So factorial means that you pair every treatment level of one treatment with every treatment level of the other treatment. So we have A, B, and C all under the control treatment and also all under the irrigation treatment. So that's a complete factorial. They don't have to be complete, but usually that's how you uh, design them. And you can obviously add more than two factors. So if I were to add a fertilizer effect to this as well, then I would have a three factor analysis of variance. And uh, usually you have to break it then down into different charts for one factor different groups for another factor and then maybe a, a color scheme or something like that for your third factor and to show them all at the same time. Now the interesting part about factorial experiments is that you can look for interactions. So what we see here is that um, my variety A and C don't behave the same way as variety B, right? So variety A and C seem to benefit from the irrigation but variety B does exactly the opposite. So that's usually important information. Um, you are looking for these interactions. So if, if there's a significant interaction effect, that usually means there's something interesting and unusual going on. And then you go back and uh, interpret it if you can. So it might be that variety B may have some issues with waterlogged soils or something like that that prevent it from uh, taking full advantage of that irrigation treatment. So if you design experiments, these two-factor complete designs where you can investigate interactions in this way is very useful. But this is actually not quite as easy anymore in three-factor designs. Um, so if you have three-factor interactions, those are usually very hard to interpret. So if you have something going on that is an interaction between fertilizer, irrigation, and treatment level, you know, I mean, this might very well be significant, but what the heck? You know, I, I can't see what's going on here. So usually this is a bad idea uh, in, in principle to design complex multi-factor experiments. You know, the whole point of experimentation is actually to reduce complexity, right? So you, you don't want to make it more complicated than necessary. So often you're left empty-handed because you just can't wrap your head around three-way interactions and, and things like that. Um, so two-factor designs are great. Um, if you have something like this, uh, you can also break it down, right? You can just analyze two-way interactions, uh, so that's possible. But then sometimes you're actually better off to just design a series of uh, two-way experiments separately or in sequence rather than uh, trying to put out one really complex design with three or four factors even. That usually ends up being a waste of your time. And it requires extra work and uh, you're, you're really setting yourself up for failure. This is my experience. Okay, so let's look, take a look at the interactions here. Um, so those are possible types of uh, interactions that you might observe. So let's take a simplified example here with just two levels of irrigation and two levels of variety. And I'm, I'm simply plotting yield here over my two treatment levels. That's an interaction plot. And that's actually one of the few examples where a line graph is uh, appropriate, uh, even though you work with class variables. So you, you can do this. This is an accepted uh, graph type that is called uh, interaction plot. So if you see parallel lines here, uh, that means you don't have interactions. So they behave consistently. Your treatment effects are consistent. So irrigation is always better than the control, and A is always better than B. Now, if they cross over, that's an interaction. 
that's also specified as a crossover interaction that you can actually test uh, for whether you have a crossover interaction. Um, so in that case, you, you may not actually get an overall treatment effect because they sometimes cancel each other out completely, right? So if I were to just look at the control treatment and just look at the irrigation treatment, my average effect across both treatment would probably be close to zero. And uh, similar for varieties, so my main effects that I see in an analysis of variance might not be significant because overall variety A and variety B, if I were to average them across both the control and the irrigation, uh, they would also both be uh, intermediate, maybe no effect, no significant effect. But if I look at the treatments in combination, then there are big effects. So you will get a significant interaction effect. And what you do then is, if you have a significant interaction effect, you uh, do carry out these interaction plots to look at the nature of your interactions. So it means you can't make simple statements, you have to qualify them. So in this case, A is better under irrigation and B is better under control treatment. And um, not all interactions need to be crossover interactions. So you can have a situation like this, where irrigation is more beneficial to variety A than variety B, but both increase. So in that case, you might get significant treatment effects, uh, significant irrigation effects, and significant interactions, because the effect is not the same for A and B. So also in this case, as soon as you have significant interactions, you want to qualify your statements. So irrigation is not always a great improvement, but sometimes it may be. So for some particular varieties, it may be, for others, maybe not. So those are simple examples, but you can extend those uh, interaction plots for multiple treatment levels. So I can add more varieties here, as many as I like. And so each one is in a line, and I can also add more uh, levels for my, for my other variable. Maybe I have a fertilizer treatment, so I see that variety A and B improve more or less linearly and then variety C is uh, behaving a little bit different, so it initially gets a great benefit, but it doesn't like the high fertilizer levels. So that is also not an untypical result, so you, you may see these kind of things with significant interaction effects, and they are important, right? So you, because you have to then make recommendations accordingly that are not simple statements like, uh, you know, your yield increases by so much percent with one times, two times, three times fertilizer, it depends on the variety, right? So for A and B, it's looking like this, and for C, you might want to treat that rather differently. <coughs> so let's look how uh, this is implemented in R. Uh, so this is pretty straightforward. This was our single factor ANOVA, and you simply add your second factor. So if you want an interaction, you add a multiplier here. If you're not interested in the interactions, you can just add a plus sign here. So then you just get the main effects. But this one here is recommended. If you have a factorial design, uh, the reason for having it is usually that you can investigate interactions. So in the syntax here, you can typically write this into an output file and we can uh, follow that up later with pairwise comparisons and effect size statistics. Um, you'll see how that works in the lab. And um, you can also get an ANOVA table out of it, or you can just uh, bracket your linear model into an ANOVA table and uh, that gives you exactly the same result. So if you have more than two factors, just add them uh, with multipliers here. Although I would say that adding a multiplier here is a bad idea because uh, it gives you all kinds of interactions. So variety times fertilizer, variety times irrigation, irrigation times fertilizer, and then the interaction between all three of them. And that is usually too much. Uh, it's not a good idea. It's not interpretable. And you're also wasting your degrees of freedom if you a test for all the interactions. So what you do, uh, starting with three effects, you just use plus signs here. So that means you're just interested in the main effect of variety, the main effect at fertilizer, the main effect of irrigation, and then put selected interactions. So if you are interested in a particular interaction, uh, then specify them manually, for example, fertilizer or irrigation interaction or any other two-way interaction that you think might be uh, useful. So you can also add two if that's uh, what you're interested in, but I would not go with that default here where everything gets tested. So the advantage of doing it this way here is that your interactions that you are not specifying here, they get pulled into the error term. Um, so this gives you a better estimate of your noise and uh, reduces the signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, so you gain statistical power by 
only testing for the interactions that you are actually interested in and, and that you know you can interpret. All right, so let's uh, take a look at how your ANOVA table gets constructed. It's actually nothing different uh, than what we had before. You get your effects, you got your degrees of freedom, just as we discussed it before. So it's a number of treatment levels minus one. Um, your interactions are the individual treatment degrees of freedom multiplied. And uh, then your error is the total number minus the degrees of freedom from your treatments multiplied, if you actually specify all possible interactions. Otherwise, for example, a three-way interaction gets pooled into this number here. So then it, this one becomes a little bit more difficult to calculate, but uh, I will do it for you, obviously. Now, the sums of squares are uh, still very important to look at. If you wonder if your interactions are, are really an important piece of uh, your overall results, uh, just calculate the variance components here, just as we said it before. So uh, if that's a big number, if that accounts for like I don't know, 20, 30 percent of your total variance that you observe in your experiment, I would say, sure, you know, that's an important effect. If it only accounts for three or five percent, even if it's significant, uh, you may not want to worry about it and you can just ignore it. So sums of squares are always important to look at. Your mean squares are the variance, is the variance between the treatments, so the signal, just as we calculated before. Your F values are the signal to noise ratio, and then you can calculate the p value manually if you like uh, with the pf function. So that's your signal to noise ratio with the two degrees of freedom that are derived uh, for the error and for your treatment. Uh, so nothing new here, very straightforward to understand, although with more complex designs, it's actually not as easy to manually calculate that anymore and virtually impossible if you have unbalanced designs. Um, but I will do it for you. So you, as long as you understand what the table means, uh, that's great. And last but not least, uh, let's uh, review a little bit of the vocabulary. I should explain this a little bit more specifically. So when you refer to a treatment or an effect, that's really the predictor variable uh, that you specify in an analysis of variance. So that would be the variety column or the farm column or whatever other column you have in your data table. So that's a class variable. And then the values within your class variable, those are called the treatment levels. So in an analysis of variant situation, you usually have more than two, but you don't have to. So you can just have two uh, as well. Analysis of variance works with that uh, just as well. But there can also be actually continuous variables that you fix at a certain level. So if you have a uh, fertilizer treatment, for example, and you set it at nothing at 20 kilogram per hectare and 40 kilogram per hectare, or if you set irrigation levels at two times a week, four times per week, six times per week, or something like that. Uh, so if they are fixed levels, um, you can define them as a class variable. And you should actually use letters here so that R doesn't misunderstand it as a continuous predictor variable. So those here are all referred to as fixed effects. So fixed effect means that the experimenter fixed those treatment levels to see what sort of effects it has on the response variable. <clears throat> and then the factorial designs that we have been talking about usually refer to complete factorial arrangements. So if you have nitrogen and potassium fertilizer, you might combine each of those nitrogen levels with each of the potassium levels, and each of them may have three reps. So this would be a complete and balanced factorial design. But you don't have to have complete design. So this one is also completely fine. Uh, there's nothing you need to do different in R. It will automatically analyze this correctly. So it's a little harder to calculate by hand, but obviously you don't have to do this. I will do it for you. So you can have unbalanced designs or incomplete factorials. Just to give you some examples, maybe you have a situation where you want to test nitrogen and potassium levels and uh, you want to compare them to business as usual. So you know that normally potassium isn't used and the level of fertilizer that people put out here is uh, 20. So that's really your control treatment. Uh, so your control is not necessarily nothing. Your control is typically a business as usual scenario. And because I want to reference everything that I see against this business of usual scenario, it might be a good idea to up the number of replications here a little bit so that you get a real accurate estimate for this. 
if you get this one wrong, then everything else is kind of wrong. So maybe let's give this uh, 12 replications in our experiment. And um, then we're thinking, you know, that may be better uh, if we put both a higher nitrogen level and some uh, potassium in there. These are my most important treatments that I think will just, just work out. So I give them six replications. And just, uh, you know, as a long shot, let's see what happens uh, with 40 nitrogen. So I'm going to add this at three replications. And I also want a zero control, so a null control is sometimes useful. Um, a null control is actually not always useful or important. Even if you think, uh, you know, that's really key to have a null control. For example, in a medical experiment, um, where you have a new drug, and what do you compare it against? Well, a placebo, of course. So you want to do a double blind test. Nobody knows what's going on. Neither the experimenter nor the uh, test patients. So that null control is really important here. But in reality, it's actually not. Because most of the time, you actually already have a competitor drug on the market. And you don't give a hoot about whether you have an effect. You want to know if it's better than the competitor. So typically, the business as usual control, so that would be the competitor's drug as a control, that is much more important if you uh, want to create value with your experimentation. But null controls can still be good. Um, uh, even uh, if they are not realistic, they're often serving as a check for screw-ups. So let's say, for example, you have some really unexpected effect, you know, your fertilizer treatment, all your plants are dying for some weird reason. You may, you may scratch your head and ask, wow, what, what happened here? Is this real, you know, or uh, did I mix things up uh, the wrong way? And instead of grabbing the nitrogen bottle, I, you know, I grabbed a can of herbicides or something like that uh, that screwed everything up. So if you have a null control that you treat religiously like every other treatment in your experiment, except that you leave out that one active ingredient that, uh, that you're investigating, uh, that can help you troubleshoot those problems. So if, if trees are dying here as well, then it has nothing to do with your uh, treatment. You know, uh, there's something else that, that went wrong for some reason. So it's especially important for complicated lab experiments with lots of ingredients. Uh, so if you have a null control, that this can help troubleshooting things. So good to include it. And just a few replications usually does the job there. So the last thing I should mention, if you have multi-level experiments, sometimes there's a temptation because you don't have a full factorial design uh, to just label them T1 through T6. So treatment one, treatment two, three, four, five, and six. That's usually not a great idea because it deprives you of being able to analyze interactions. And so this one, basically you default back to a single factor ANOVA. It's just a treatment and each treatment is actually a more complicated combination of things. So only in case where you have a matrix of multiple treatment types that is really spotty, right? So, so where, it's, where it's really very incomplete, uh, then you can do that. So you can uh, do these types of experiments uh, where you have good reason to look for uh, particular combinations that you want to test, but you don't want to go uh, into a full factorial design. Uh, so then you can default to a a simple analysis and this will obviously work just fine except you don't get the benefit of being able to look at interactions good so this is uh, multi-factor ANOVA everything else stays the same so you can still follow this up with pairwise comparisons uh, and with effect size statistics so if you want you can go straight to the lab and uh, try this first part out here so those are the links here